everybody. Welcome in the third episode of Court of Basketball Coaches. Today we will have a one special guest, the international coach, Mr. Vladimir Bosniak. Vladimir Bosniak worked before in Europe, Asia, Africa like a head coach with club teams and national teams. Uh, and uh, in the United States he spent several years like an assistant coach. So he will bring a very big knowledge, very big experience from different continents and uh, different countries. So I think that we will have one very exciting basketball conversation. Uh, our main topics like basketball expert topics will be UCLA cut and offensive uh, plays. But before we will try to compare styles of these continents, countries, what kind of experience I am bringing, uh, Mr. Vladimir Bosniak is bringing. And I would love to ask all of our viewers and followers that you can send your questions. We will try to answer for it beside our basketball topics. But we will try, uh, we will try uh, to answer for your questions. Uh, last time, for example, when we did the short promo uh, video, uh, there was there was I think uh, the name Sam Willis that uh, asked some question. I hope that he will be online and he will try uh, to be online and to send again his questions. So we are open to talk with you. Uh, we will just wait that uh, to make the connection with Mr. Vladimir Bosniak. I see that he is here. Welcome, uh, Mr. Vladimir Bosniak. Uh, how are you? Are Hi, you coach. How are you doing? Perfect, perfect. I was talking about you, about uh, your experience, your stations in uh, four continents and about uh, our program. I'm very happy that you are here. Maybe first time when we opened the live, maybe the internet connection was bad. So I think that let let's start our talking. Uh, I would love to ask yeah. from you first to go back in the time. And now let's talk about it. Uh, when you started to be a basketball coach uh, in the in the former Republic of Yugoslavia and Serbia, uh, so I would love now to speak about your experience with club teams and the national teams from these continents and some different countries. So let's start now with Serbia and Yugoslavia. When I was coaching Yugoslavia and Serbia from 1986. And I found out with my height. Two meter, one centimeter, I cannot be a good player. So I decided to I start with the girls in the Red Star Club. Coach Zorinovic, my former coach, accepted me as assistant. And first steps I learned from him. And after that, from many other coaches. But uh, what I try to say about uh, those days, I'm a poet that I'm this much unshaved, like that I have some uh, mountain uh, climbing uh, experience and exercise, so I didn't have time to shave, but I mean, how, you see, at that time, we didn't pay, like, I started to be coaches, and before that, I was a player in basketball, we didn't have an idea that one day we would have a bubble, and bubble would be something even worse than quarantine, you cannot bring your haircut, man, your pedicure, or anybody who could help you. Look better, we have now preparation for the uh, African windows for uh, African basket 2021. So I apologize to you, coach, and to all those uh, people who would watch us that I look a little bit uh, not clean, I'm saved and somehow, but this is due to the, my presence in the hotel where we are uh, last eight days. So you can yes. make account that it go, you know, you need to have. Uh, this kind of uh, helpful things uh, I would get soon I would, uh, for the games I would be sharp and ready but now I don't look that much so it started 1986 when uh, Simona from Zagreb was dominating in the European League and at that time uh, uh, Red Star surprised them in uh, semi-finals mm -hmm. Uh, with the uh, great players uh, who later on play significant role, Nena Nesha, Debojša Nesha Ilić, other guy, uh, Bane Prelević, president of Park, and other guys. And I was just a coach uh, of the mini basket girls. And next year I moved to the Partizan, who that year won the championship. 
little uh, young coach at that time, famous like uh, coach for individual work development of players, Dusko Dule Vujosevic, uh, was coaching Partizan, and I had opportunity to become a coach of the mini basket group in Partizan next year. <clears throat> and I was famous like a guy who was coming on his individual purchase and passing to the, his, the best players. My favorite was current president of the basketball coach, uh, basketball federation and association, Predak Sasha Danilovic. He was a young, 17 years old player, and I was his passer, and he had to score 1,000 shots each day. So that was my start, that was my beginning with the mini basket generation born 1975. And later on, we won under 14, 15, 16, those all championships. So this is my start like a young coach. And we are talking now a little about the uh, time in Yugoslavia. You mentioned Prelevic, uh, Sasha Danilovic. Um, uh, can you compare, please? Nice yes, can you compare, please, now the basketball in Yugoslavia and Serbia at the moment? Because I think in the 80s and the 90s, there were a lot of, lot of very, very good players. And there was a rule in Yugoslavia that until 28, you can't go abroad. So these players are uh, staying here. And let's say that when I was following uh, the Yugoslavian basketball, there were some clubs that maybe, let's say, for example, Stravje from Leskovac, that you went to Leskovac and maybe even Partizan or Red Star, they are losing from them because it was a very, very quality league uh, in those times. So please uh, try to compare, uh, in your opinion, this time and uh, now in Serbia, what is the situation in basketball? Well, you know what? First of all, still there is Yugoslav basketball from the many things. Uh, that school, what former uh, Yugoslav coaches now became separated, had how they get prepared for the practice, how they uh, put emphasis on certain positions to work with on certain levels, exist until today. Even if today we have much more uh, YouTube uh, Google things, uh, DVDs, uh, playbooks, which come from the toughest leagues is that EuroLeague, especially college basketball and after uh, above the all NBA basketball. Still, we have those who were starting at the time, we have similarities in a mentality and in a way of thinking. But it's not only that, uh, Coach uh, Hurkan, this is another story which I want to tell you. Uh, unfortunately, Yugoslavia exists, I say unfortunately, in a, that way that when we separated, I think the best would be that everybody was follow his own league and develop from that league the best players. No, immediately, greedy, after changes in Serbia 2000, many clubs moved immediately to the that uh, Adriatic League, which I don't think that that league is good for the developing of basketball because <clears throat> pretty soon other leagues like BTB, that Russian league, and those former Soviet Union, Poland, those Ukraine before these events, uh, they started to be much uh, more expensive, much more paid than those uh, uh, teams in former Yugoslavia because economy in former Yugoslavia is not that big and very soon, players started to leave uh, local leagues, uh, go to the bigger, bigger regional leagues and European leagues. And some of them were lucky and good to go to the United States to play uh, NBA basketball. And that kind of thing destroyed uh, quality and level of basketball, which was not in the 90s when the, the country was collapsed or falling apart. And yet, you have many good teams. Buducinos from Montenegro started to be new, new big team. Parties of the Red Star were remaining good. Hamo Farm, uh, other club, uh, FMP, Zelaznik. All those teams, even Vojvodina, uh, Zorka Shabac, uh, Čačak, and other Slovak Radio, they had good teams. And if I miss somebody, I am... Uh, it was uh, Subotica Spartak, of course, 
uh, you know, that was a much better league. That league was much better than uh, many, many teams who are playing, almost all teams who are playing to that Adriatic League with the many locals who were growing up, becoming good players and moving out. Unfortunately, instead of that today, we have uh, Adriatic League, A-level, B-level, but I don't see that brought any quality to the, those clubs, local clubs. I still think that was a mistake, and Partizan, not only because I'm a fan of Partizan, was sustained and uh, surviving the longest, and therefore they were winning after that a lot of Adriatic League Championship because they didn't greatly immediately move to that so-called, I don't know how to call it, the regional league, which later on turned down to be, for example, Maccabi, when they lose rights to play in uh, EuroLeague championship uh, competition, they moved to Adriatic League for one year. They were hosts of the championship. That was 2011 or 12, something like that. They moved, uh, they organized uh, Final Four over there. They won, Maccabi, Tel Aviv won, and they got qualified back to the EuroLeague. That league became like a bus station or like train station for teams who wanted to move to another level. But, you know, it's not the same level like former Yugoslavia. Even little Yugoslavia, which is Serbia and Montenegro, games were much higher level of quality than are today. I agree with you 100%. And let's see about, for example, Adriatic League. Before Adriatic League in the EuroLeague, Serbia had one place, Slovenia had one place, Croatia had one place. So our region, our region uh, for us was good to have these three clubs. And now you have Adriatic League and you need to fight for one place. And maybe even a question you will playing sometimes Euroleague or something. So I think for this region was bad. And let's say that the Serbian league, I think, had quality. But for example, Croatian, Slovenian, Bosnian leagues, maybe they have only one, two teams, teams who are better. So I, th I think that Serbia uh, not get benefit with the Adriatic league about what you are, what you are talking about. And and I think that um, maybe for maybe for our country uh, it was not a big uh, benefit. I don't know. Do you agree with this? I agree hundred percent. That was a political uh, move and political action that was not beneficial for the basketball, and especially that ca happened. I was always voting against that guy who was changed to not even now, it's not important to mention his name and his party. Yeah, in October 2000, I was uh, his uh, uh, political opponent. But from that October 2000, when new people came to be in charge in politics, they very fastly and uh, swiftly started to make those uh, changes and a long round that hurt Serbian basketball. We could still play big Serbian league and yet have one representative to Euroleague. Yeah. And who knows? I'm sure with that kind of the policy, our players would certainly be uh, in a much bigger number sold to other countries. Yeah. Why he has to go immediately to uh, uh, Real Madrid or to Barcelona or Anywhere, Alba Berlin, yeah. he can stay, play, be paid, and later on go wherever he wants to go. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, many other countries grew up around us. Hungary was first, but later on, that was Romania. Romania is now, <clears throat> as we say, Mecca and Medina. Yes, for, for many, players. let's say, uh, mid level of quality players. There are many clubs over there, many foreigners can play. That's also not good for Romanians, you know. They, they, they have many foreigners in their league. They don't have their own yes. players who are significant. Yes, the local players. I remember uh, that uh, guy, Murashan, what was his yeah. name? Yeah, okay, Murashan. Popa, yeah. uh, 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 who was Pope, what was his name? Who I was playing Pope was the third, before. Yes. I don't remember. 
Bogdan Popescu was a good player. But I don't remember many Romanian good players. And as you see, they never achieved higher level in European competition because they exactly took that rule five, six foreigners, which doesn't help. Yes. growing up the basketball. And, uh, you know, as more locals you have good, which I'm trying now to do here in Ranga, to teach people that in our local league there are good players who are temporarily not good level, but in a year or two they can get bigger. When they get bigger and better, we would certainly achieve success in the international level. Uh, thanks God in Africa now due to the, all those problems was in the United States and everywhere, uh, where, you know, they organize now um, ball, ball, I'm sorry, ball, ball is Basketball African League. NBA decided to support because the most and the best talented NBA players are having roots here in Africa. And of course, because of all those difficulties and hardships were there in the uh, last spring, they decided to invest some money in uh, their motherland. And that is a good news for African basketball that local leagues would have representative in a ball and uh, 12 to 16 teams would play strong uh, African club basketball league. And that can be a significant difference before what was going on and after. And many local players would grow up in a, that way. And I always try to tell them, try to push as much locals as you can. That would be good for national team, but not only for national team, that would be back and forth good for the clubs. Because player who is capable, you mentioned, Lesko was that. I always remember my games when I was a women's coach of Red Star. Uh, you know, every game in Chachak against Gradac was a headache for me. was a big headache. What are Chachak if you little, Yes, they can shoot from another gym and score. That's terrible. Then you are a guest. <laughs> and, you know, those fans who are behind your back provoking you, telling you bad things. Those uh, girls from Chachak who played Red Star, when they tell me, Coach, don't let them catch us because the spectators will become unbelievably bad, you know, with their comments and this and that. And we barely survive, my dear friend. And I always say that kind of games are developing local yes. basketball. Yes. And, <clears throat> you know, I am a fan of that, but, you know, maybe I'm not right. That's another story. Somebody certainly make fortune out of this. It's not you and me, but again, you know, at least opinion is, as they say in America, like us, everybody has one. This is my opinion, yeah. I agree with you 100%. And I think those rules in some leagues that they can play, for example, five foreigners on the court, that is for sure bad for the improvement and development for the local players. This is only to have maybe a little more uh, quality league, but it is uh, for the like for the, to have a good national team that will have some uh, opposite uh, thing. Let's go now to the United States of America. You was working, you spent there uh, several years like an assistant coach. Can you speak uh, what kind of impact uh, that had on you? Because let's say there is a different style like uh, Serbian or Yugoslavian style. Maybe the organization is much different. Maybe there are more people in the staff, more people who are for maybe scouting, maybe for other parts. Maybe the head coach is not doing so many things like in Europe. So can you speak about for our viewers, uh, what was your uh, opinion about this everything like organization and trainings? When I went to the state, this was 1991 to 1996, five years I was there, so five years it's completely at that time different story than what we were doing like ordinary coaches. I don't call myself extraordinary coach. First of all, I never got a chance to coach um, under 16, under 18 national selection in former Yugoslavia or in Serbia. I was never pushed by somebody, uncle, aunt, grandfather, grandmother to get a job, a main job 
that didn't happen to me. So, uh, you know, uh, from that point, I was ordinary man who was following better coaches than me, and I had some idols. But, you know, at that time, when you didn't play organized basketball in a Division One league, like I didn't play, I was a bench warmer. When you didn't have a coaches who were under the umbrella of Professor Nikolic, who was really the closest to American. And it's not by accident that Professor Nikolic became the first uh, non-American Hall of Famer. Yes, yes. He was a guy who was many years in the States. He understood that basketball. He was visiting John Wood and Adolf Rupp and other guys. <clears throat> uh, so he knew their workouts, their philosophy. And he was the guy who finally started to organize not only organize play offenses, uh, organize transition in the first break, which was at that time unbelievably new. He started to organize uh, defensive transition. Uh, he was the first guy who was teaching his point guards because at that time point guards were always standing on the top of the key area, run first back, stop, how we called it, Shabbat's uh, fast break, Shabbat's contra, <laughs> stop easy points. You know, that was the first coach. When I came in the States and when I found out there is a running assignment in defense, uh, transition defensive, not offensive drill, I was looking like this. I didn't know what's going on. Uh, of course, other of those three things like it's shell drills, uh, help side, weak side, strong side, uh, double defense, but double defense not when you are 20 points ahead, when you want to make your opponent struggle, you know, uh, not just in a, uh, losing the ball, making turnovers, making point guards, perimeters, tired, making fours and fives, helping in a, converting the ball from the one side to another. For me, that was a science fiction. I was a year, then I was two years, and I started to understand more. Third year, I started to understand more. Fourth, I think it took me five years, and exactly when I started to see the bigger picture, I found out that it's almost science fiction to become a head coach in that basketball, and I wanted to come back to Europe. And uh, I think I didn't make a mistake because, you know, I belong to Europe. I was born in Belgrade, in Serbia, et cetera, et cetera. But this was a something what in America, for example, those things we always like to have a tall guys who can shoot the outside shot well. I'm very proud of that. Then, you know, when I say he can be three and two, they ask me first, can he guard three and two on the other end? I didn't understand what does it mean. I said, how do you mean by, you know, defense is when you put your ass down and try hard says, is he quick in his feet or is he slow with the footwork? Then you find out about that new new word, athleticism, which in America exists 50, 60, 70 years. But, you know, uh, we started to hear first time good athlete, 90s and later, you know, especially when 24 seconds became obvious. Uh, thing when FIBA changed the rules, those 24 seconds helped uh, us understand what athlete is about. And I was happy. I had chance to be assistant coach in the teams where was player Igor Kocic, Vlada Kuzmanovic, and those other guys who are great. And I am very happy. Milanko Topic, Jalastanovic, Jelko Topalovic, Vojka Bedzic. Uh, Dan Mishkovic, do not now go if I forgot somebody, Igor Perovic, I am I'm apologizing to all of them, uh, Zlatko Bolic, of course, and uh, uh, that was a great basketball, uh, also Partizan had a great team, FNP Jalazin had, had a great team, that was better after better was coming, and those games would be for me forever, great memory, how was a good basketball at that time, but we already started to have more explosive, more athletic players. Then in the 80s, when we more pay, more pay attention to how players look. Is he long, tall? Does he have a long legs, long arms? And we later on found out it doesn't have to be that important if he is slow. 
it doesn't matter how tall you are, as they were teaching us, is the most important how high a level of your gain is. That's the story. Uh, you worked in Africa and Asia too, with clubs in China and Middle East, in Africa. Uh, even you was a head coach for national team Iran, Syria, Libya, and now you are head national coach for Rwanda. In Rwanda. For Rwanda, yes. Uh, can you speak about it or now here to work? Because I think here is again much different. How was the organization? How, how is the cooperation with some federations? How is the club life? Because, and for example, you can say some interesting story if something happened with you in Africa or in Asia. Well, you know what? Different countries, different uh, eth ethos, ecologies, different uh, issues, different things, you know. So I don't want to now get uh, deep in the details uh, which country was uh, uh, good or uh, how to say uh, uh, way better or a little bit better for me to work i was in libya first after red star women uh, women's team which we 2001 won the, the second place in a cup and in a league we moved to the, uh, I moved to Libya and I was in Libya with my, we came like two coaches with my uh, friend, president of the Serbian Coaches Association, Ivan Jerevic. I was there two years, he was one year, then he moved to be assistant to Dusan Ivkovic, legendary, legendary coach from Serbia, former Yugoslavia, in CSK Moscow. I was there uh, several years in, uh, two years in Libya. And we beat Tunis, which is same like uh, uh, Serbia would in football. Unfortunately, we don't have good results. Beat uh, Spain or Italy, you know, that was the biggest success I made. Then we moved to, I moved to Iran two years. We won over there almost everything. I was only third on the Islamic Games where I didn't have the best players, but uh, we were first in, uh, uh, we were first in Asia. And we got qualified under 20 for the World Cup 2005 in Cordoba. We beat China 75-50, and that was my the best, maybe, success. Then later on, other coaches, Toroman, Matic, my other friends came. They were coaches there in Iran. I was moving to golf, which really I don't belong with my uh, temper and nature. Uh, over there is a little slower basketball. You have to be much more calm, nicer to the players. I am more demanding. I like, for me, these African uh, countries are much better because African players love to get better. They like, love to develop, and I love them to that. And uh, excellent people, excellent humans. And uh, here uh, I was also in Ivory Coast, in Gabon, uh, and uh, we won there, and I moved now to uh, Rwanda, two years I'm there. Before Rwanda, I was in Georgia, former Soviet Union, in Batumi, so that was a club I was coaching in, and in that club, uh, we team who was uh, kicked out of Division One. politically they kept them, and we succeeded with me to be fifth, even if we didn't have the best local players. Georgian League is a strong league. Georgia is 36th on a FIBA ranking list. And I succeeded to be, to be how to say, uh, fifth, even if team was kicked out of league a year ago. And I see now they have good success. I like them a lot. That was a great time I had over there. Last two years and a half. I'm here in uh, in Rwanda, and uh, I really uh, a lot of people here. They're devoted to basketball. We are missing indoor facilities more because we are a country with, uh, as you know, uh, rain seasons. Uh, climate here is beautiful. We talked about these four continents. You was changing a lot of clubs. Uh, I was changing several clubs too, and I must to say that uh, the new experience were changing me a little. So let's see that maybe uh, maybe if you are working in a, on a bigger level or a lower level basketball, I don't know, do you agree that maybe in a lower level basketball country you can learn new things, 
you can improve your knowledge and like yourself. And that is my question. That do you agree with this? And my and the other question is that that what kind of impact had on you uh, to be a national coach in different countries, to be a club coach in different countries? So what kind of impact had on you? And how much this changed maybe your knowledge? Maybe they changed it philosophy or or your style so that i would love to share with our viewers and followers first of all you can always learn from the people uh who are uh how to say uh working with you uh you can work good things how it has to be done you can see something what should not be done but doesn't matter that's not important you should be thankful and have a gratitude to everybody who was associated with you in the basketball so i was also by watching the players i was working somewhere for example in a country such as a uh, lower level of basketball not only in a even in africa where the best athletes are were born uh, you have sphere from the layup Players sometimes don't like to shoot a layup because they're scared to get blocked. Even if many times the teams win when block shot was uh, uh, more on the opponent's side in a statistics, for example, some team has a four, five, seven block shots, yet they lost the game. Uh, the knowledge to go hard to shoot over the tall man or taller man, bigger man, stronger man, to shoot without fear, to keep doing that, keep going, are, in my opinion, the best quality for any basketball, including uh, uh, current basketball I work in, random basketball. We need to develop the players who have to score even if they play from the outside perimeter position, they should come to the hoop, shouldn't score. But funny thing happened in Iran. I was also hired. Iran today is a significant basketball. They have one player who was playing in NBA, Hamid Haddadi. I was a coach who put him in a senior national team. He is 2 meters, 14 centimeters. So certainly if somebody else would be inside of me, would do the same sooner or later. But my truly yours was the guy who was putting him into the senior national Team. He never played official game before that, and he was a good player for me in a previous uh, and after that events. Great guy, and uh, Hamid uh, was a prototype of the players such as Vlade Divac, Paul Gasol, and others. <laughs> but that's not so important now. Like this, that I had a team manager. Unfortunately, he passed away. Mr. Reza was his name. He was the best player when he was playing basketball, but he was famous when he goes to the hoop to score the layup. And when he sees that somebody who would block his shot uh, is coming after him, he stopped the action, make the walk or double dribbling, leave the ball on the baseline and goes back to play defense. With a message to another guy, you can jump as much as you want. You are not going to block me. Of course, that kind of basketball is evil. You have to go, you have to shoot, even somebody is going to block your shot. Because more you practice, more repetitions you do, you would find a way. And finally, the best players were scoring against anybody. Good player can score or shoot the free throws. Nobody remembers Nikola Jokic is now the king of the basketball. But 2016 in Olympic Games, against Croatia in a qualification. It was a uh, quarterfinals, I think. We beat Croatians. Nikola was four out of four on the free throw line. Many better players at that time would not make four out of four in a crucial moment he did. So uh, scoring the lap against the stronger guy, shooting over the hand against the uh, player in a crucial moment, like Sasha Georgi, which was doing most of his career, uh, making the free throws on a free throw line in a crucial time, that separates average player, mediocre, from the real, genuine uh, star. Can you compare, please, NBA and EuroLeague? For example, you mentioned Nikola Jokic. Nikola Jokic rebounding the ball sometimes and dribbling from one hook to another. 
I think in Euroleague uh, this is impossible because Euroleague is much better than defense. But let's say that when Allen Iverson came to Besiktas, he said that men in Europe they are training so lot. Yes, in NBA there are a lot of matches in the regular season, in the playoffs. Every third day is a match. You must to go to the plane. So maybe in the summer you need to prepare your team because during the season you not have so many time for uh, tactic uh, changes. For me, is Euroleague like for a coach? Uh, is a league to learn a lot tactically. But let's say NBA is much different. Uh, the head coach has a big staff. Maybe the head coach is more a manager. Like I have a special coach for for shooting. Uh, I have a special coach for uh, scouting, and that is a uh, much uh, different because it is like a, more a franchise, like a club. So can you compare NBA and uh, European basketball, especially Euroleague, because you were in Europe, in Europe and the United States of America too? I was in uh, Euroleague, never working. I was working in. Uh, I'm in Europe. I'm in Europe. Europe. Playing at that time, uh, Coupe Italia Courage with Red Star. And I was also working first year when I was a young student in the United States. I was working like a statistician in Milwaukee Bucks. But you know what? Uh, the quality is on the uh, NBA player side. There are much tougher leagues before during the season in Euroleague than in NBA because players at the beginning of the league, better players they are, they're coming in a less good shape. They're adjusting during the first part of the season and they're winning by the real quality they have. They're great quality players. Later on, later on, it becomes uh, completely different. Uh, when playoff comes, NBA teams are dramatically improving, playing more defense. And for example, when I saw this bubble NBA in Florida, unfortunately it was a COVID, so they have to adjust and they did a great job. But you see the results, 60, 50, 53, first half is not over yet. That yes. kind of things in the playoffs in uh, NBA are unbelievable before. But obviously, you know, when players don't play so much, they lose sense for defense, for steel, for aggressiveness. And, you know, they need the time to come back. Well, in that name, I'm very much excited uh, about this uh, African national team competitions because we would finally have a chance to play with... Uh, with the with, 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 with the real teams, defense, offense, everything, which COVID interrupted. But uh, certainly NBA basketball became a role model for many coaches. Uh, we have crazy people before, including all of us who were working at that time, who would practice, practice, and after that, practice again. Now you have to a little bit calm down. You cannot every day have same level of practice. You have to learn when you slow down, when you elevate. And, you know, you cannot just let phys uh, fitness coaches to be the butchers of your team. They have to go slow down. They have to develop the team step by step. And no any crazy exercises before you make a test. I always love to see my, my uh, fitness coach who was here from Serbia called Serbo. He came and first what he saw, uh, what I saw he died, did, he test the players. We don't understand uh, how much is important what they do in the United States. They don't let you practice before you, they test everything. They take medical examinations, they take fitness examinations, they see your nutritionism, and after that, they organize plans. So, you know, uh, many things which are Can you see me? Yes, 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 yes. yes. It, is, it is because of the bad internet connection, so you can, you can. Oh, okay. again, Let me speed up a little bit now because yes. I have some other things to do. So can we go to the topics now? Those, yes, yes, uh, about yes, of clinic? course. Yes, of course. Now we are going for the topics. So let's go first for the offensive plays. 
uh, so ca can you can you speak about not just about uh, uh, coaches on what they need to focus you can say how you are trying to play with your teams especially if you have more trainings and less trainings number okay. of trainings. first of all uh, with the more or less practices you always have to have good selection or you have to have good substitution for the mediocre selection you have when we talk about football team we know goalkeeper is the most important person you can have uh, ronaldo and messi but sooner or later if good goalkeeper is defending them and other people from defense they would find a way to score also against them but if you have a good goalkeeper and after that, Ronaldo, Messi, and other guys, you have a chance to win a lot. So, point guard in a basketball is like a goalkeeper in a football. If you don't have a good point guard who can hold the ball, who can speed up, slow down, uh, make a difference, find you when you're open, and at the end, when nobody else is capable to score, have the ball, and be the decision maker and the scoring guy, you forget organized basketball. So you have to have a good point guard. After good point guard, you have to have other people who are capable to play strong, to rebound. You cannot win any level of game. Any level of basketball game if you don't have a rebounds. Rebounds is independent part the the you have rebounds in defense you have rebounds in offense you remember dennis rodman you remember those other guys yeah. i go to the days uh, even before rodman when we have a good class who can rebound so at that time we definitely uh, uh are searching for the good ball man who can organize our place and who can run uh, the offense. The biggest problem we have with our game is that we sometimes have so many playbooks. We love uh, so much uh, to follow up that, but we don't uh, understand that sometimes our players cannot play every offense you design or you saw to be designed. So, you know, when we talk about this uh, topic today, uh, offense, uh, we have to learn uh, to, to go after the offensive plays which produce uh, many ways to score, especially if you are not that much dominated inside with your height and with your power. Uh, in this following topic, I would write for coaches uh, on the ground who struggle with the best selection. I would like to uh, try to show the different uh, variety of the plays and lineups they have uh, for their players. So uh, you can't win the championship if you don't have inside game in the paint or so-called three seconds area. But in order to win a lot and stay in the same level or move to another level, don't lose this level, go from Division 1 to Division 2, from Division 2 to Division 3, you have to have a good point guard. We call the point guard also in my country and your country, playmaker. Yes. Playmaker, as word says, is making the plays. Point guard takes the, uh, a ball and gets uh, to the point area by trying to score or assist, as we know. Uh, for offense, I have today, uh, we need to have a player's two and three position who are capable to score from the outside. Uh, you know, shooting is the best in an area uh, of the developing because you can have the hardest shot, the, the less flexible hand than anybody, the tightest hand than anybody else. But if you every day, like Sasha Danilo, if you're shooting 1,000 or scoring 1,000 shots, you would certainly sooner or later win the game. I always like that uh, Spain offense, first of all, because Americans call that Spain, because they saw that in countries such as uh, uh, Spain, they have pick and roll, like in every other country, Jordi Mirobradovic was famous, like a guy who was playing those... Uh, 
place uh, with a pick and roll. Many times Dusan Dudevkovic is teaching us, you cannot, you don't have all players like Obradovic is having, don't just play pick and roll and coach. Dudevkovic was right, you know, we have to design the offenses without that game. But what was good with the Spanish national team, the Davis and the clubs, they started to use pick for the lo- roll, uh, roller. For instance, let's say CSK Horn set goes when one has the ball on the top, five and four are five on the right elbow, four is on the left elbow, and two is on the left side of the corner, three is on the right side of the corner. So that makes one, two, two formation where one would dribble to the five and four would make a screen for the two down pick or off screen and two should be capable to catch the ball somewhere on the three-point shot area elbow extension uh elbow extension not uh 45 degree but i would say that 75 degrees something like that more on the top of the key area and five is immediately entitled to go to do the uh, to make the, how to say, the pick and roll with him. Of course, in that uh, in that moment, one would move uh, on the right side because he is on the side with the five, two on the left side took the ball, one is uh, siding on the right side, and three from the corner runs. You would have those diagrams and you can show them later on uh three is making a back pick or even if it's not a back pick three can just make a traffic jam down there around the filter area so five has a chance to drop down to roll and four has to pop out to be on a three point line. also this is a typical four out one in offense well what can happen after that uh, here in the CSK uh, alignment, you have uh, four who is getting open and two can pass ball to him. But also two can go deeper down, one can move to the corner and three can pop out and get the ball first and after that pass to the four. The aim is that ball goes to the five. We're now coming to the fives, not like those American fives who are just going inside to score. We're talking about fives like Vladi Divans before him, Krasimir Ciosic, Paul Gasol, Nenad Krstic, all those guys who get the ball on a low post position and they can now be a point guard on a low post position. They can go inside the score, but they can deliver the pass to the open guys like Nikola Jokic is doing today. He is the best significant example of that. So in CSK, Pat, when four, five gets the ball on a low post, four, who is on three points, elbow extension, is going to make the vertical pick to the three. Three was uh, somewhere uh, below the three point slide and uh, above the free throw. And we have interchanging the position of uh, three and four. Three is in, uh, ability to get the retreat pass to shoot three point shot. Two and one spread their sp- uh, spot up on the other side. And we have a good, good three point shot solution with a one man inside who can go and score. Also four after the screen for three can make a cut, uh, pop in to the area and make a difference, you know. Uh, he can also be on the offensive rebound. And there are many, many other things important, but the most important that we follow up that new ideology from our Princeton coaches and from NBA, that we have a stretching four out, that we have three other perimeter players out, and we have a five in. That creates to us ability that, for example, if three is a tall, small forward, if he is a big uh, three, he can also make a inside move, make uh, those split moves, and get the ball and score. So this is another advantage we have out of that. I was sending you Spain pick and roll basketball playbook. So you have that on the YouTube and you can put that. Yes. That's a very good uh, exercise uh, you can uh, watch. And really, you know, I 
uh, I encourage uh, all our colleagues to uh, take that and see that because uh, Spain is something which didn't come from the United States. And what really tells how Americans are good, they recognize that this comes from the uh, from the uh, other country and they didn't know who was a coach, who was a player, who was this and that, who was a, uh, what was the club. They called the name Spain. Hopefully one day we would have something called Serbia yes. or call something like Hurkan or Vladimir or whoever. And I'm looking forward for that day. And meanwhile, I would like to say something about the UCLA cuts, which are interesting. Coach John Wooden was famous. You see, UCLA is because of his school, University of yes. uh, California, LA, Los Angeles. And uh, that play has to do a lot with the diff uh, different enters, but uh, uh, there is no typical pick and roll uh, play at the beginning. Uh, before pick and roll, we have many, many, many uh, back screens, which means one and four are again in a, let's say that transition early offense. One is on an elbow on the right side extension. Four is on an elbow on the left side extension. Three is a little bit below the elbow extension on the left side. Two is a little bit on a elbow extension and below on the right side. Two is getting the ball and five is making the pick immediately. Back pick UCLA cut for one. Four, S, uh, two got the ball and cannot pass to one. Four is making the off pick again, like in previous offense on a weak side, and three is capable to catch the ball on a somewhere in a, let's say 75 degree from the uh, elbow, from the hook. Then we have following things. Uh, that was the first UCLA cut, and if you have a tall one uh, who can get the ball and score bravely, that's the great benefit. Two pass to the three, who was getting open on the top of the key area. And uh, four on the bottom line is making on the left side screen for the one. One is again. So if you have a good pointer, this is the offense for him. The pointer gets the ball more often. One is getting the ball back from the three. And now five is making the UCLA cut for the three, which really helps uh, for those coaches, fans, players who are slam dunk psychos who love to see that LA passes. This can be an easy basket, sometimes even end one, which develops our game. So uh, after one couldn't pass the ball to three, he is using a pick and roll from the five. Five is going to make a pick to one. Four and three are leaving the paint area. They're now on the left side. Two is moving to the corner, and one and five have a two-on-two -two game. That's, for example, excellent play. That ball, if you want to come back to the ball man who you respect a lot, you have immediately a reversal pass, and it helps you win the game. So this is another, another, another play I would strongly like to recommend to our uh, colleagues. Meanwhile, I also sent one baseline out from Mike Fratello, which I think you would like to, to watch. That is the great play. If you play man-to-man -man offense, I won many games with his encounters, and it's an even better play when you play against the zone. Because, you know, I don't know if Coach Kirk and Herkai is going to play after timeout zone against me or man. I had one strong recommendation when I was coaching Georgia. Uh, people were thinking that you can take time out only when you have offensive position. That is wrong. Very simply, you don't have always to have the best team that you score uh, after you drive some uh, play on a back, uh, uh, backboard as you are coaching a clipboard as you uh, are doing when you're in NBA. It's easy to call offense for rest in peace Kobe Brown, for retired uh, Charles Barkley or Michael Jordan for LeBron James, but 
Chris Paul and all those, Rondo, other guys, but you know, you cannot. Uh, sometimes you have to call the timeout to change the defense, and maybe you can steal the ball, and the last three, four positions you didn't score. In the fifth position, you score because of the steal. Then they can, after that, get warm again your players and start to score. So many times I advise the coaches, whenever it's a sun, baseline out, sideline out for opponent, you take time out. Because you can change something. You can make some other difference. And you can, after that, steal the ball. I did have that, for example, in Georgia and Batumi. Uh, since they don't know what they play, uh, what we would play, they can play those beautiful screen for the screener, back picks, down picks, flare picks. But if you're in a zone, everybody is coming to the defensive guy. You know, you can cover that. The most important, you don't get, get a slam dunk over the baseline, sideline, etc. So what, what is good? I think that is very good what Coach Rotella is teaching us. You attack the zone with the, with the corners and with the high post. This offense, this uh, baseline out has attack on the low post, two corner guys, and has a guy popping out like a high post or power forward. Those kind of things help you win the game. Anyway, you know, uh, I hope I did help you a little bit with these uh, things. Please put those diagrams in videos. And Listen. hopefully we will continue to cooperate. Only I have some other things to do. As I told you, I'm in the middle of the bubble. Sorry for bad connections. And no, 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 looking no. forward to see you soon. Uh, can I ask only one more question? It will be a short. Please. To please uh, give your suggestion for young coaches. Let's say I will say uh, how I became a coach. I had a mentor nine years. He was a coach uh, before in the best league in Yugoslavia. I was need I was need to read a lot of books in that time. What's his name? What's his uh, name? Tell uh, me. He was leading uh, Topolčanka from Bačka Topola. His name was Mirko Kujundžić. Uh, because okay. you know Topol Topolčanka before played the uh, best league in, in, in Yugoslavia. Always mention your coach. There are people who live and die and we forget them and we watch just those nice suit Armani three four thousand uh, mm -hmm. euros on themselves with the nice watches also one thousand euro with the shoes two thousand euros you know we have to remember those people who were yes. teaching us and giving us yes. basics. and I'm, I'm very thankful for him after I was following a lot of seminars for example for me was big impact that body weight when get a life achievement award, he said only, I am now talking to the young coaches, showed his hand, enthusiasm. That was a very big impact for, for me. And let's say that uh, for me was Dusha Nivkovic and Jacob Obrado, which I followed them. I get great motivation from men basketball. From, big uh, legends, big from, legends. From, all from of them, passionate. Yes, yes. Radkovic, of from, course. From, from, from female uh, basketball. Laszlo uh, 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 All of them, yes. you know. Dirty. Yes, yes, yes. And that is my, but, that is my but, question. Vata Djordjevic and those older guys, Siga Vasovic, those are people who we cannot yes. forget. For example, I was also beside uh, Boris Sage, who was coach to all of us. I was studying from Atsa Janic, Čačak, uh, basketball coach, Kicanovic coach, who later on moved to Belgrade and Partizan School of Basketball. Owed to him a lot of gratitude what he did in the Partizan. Igor and other coaches I was with associated, Coach Kovacevic, I was learning from them. Coach Zoran Jovanovic, I'm thankful to all of them. And therefore, you know, young coaches have to have enthusiasm, have to be devoted. And what Alexander Nikolic, I can just say one short uh, quote of him. When you sign the contract, you can sign for the 100 euros, for example. Don't watch that somebody else is paid 200, 300, 1,000 euros. You work for that 100 euros duration of contract you sign. When you finish the contract, you come and say to the, your owners of the club, Sorry, I'm not going to be associated with you anymore unless you pay me more or I'm not going to be associated at all. I would go somewhere else. But never watch how somebody is working for more money somewhere else. Watch your business and you will not go wrong. That was Professor Nikolic. I was on his alive lectures in a school, not only on a seminar, on a clinic. And 
I think really it's not by accident he is the best Hall of Famer uh, uh, out of the United States forever because of that. Yes, and that is my question. What is your suggestion for younger coaches and at that, now at this moment, uh, how they can come become a more better coach? Because now on the internet, you can find a lot of things. Before 20 years, 30 years, we will not be able to follow so many things. So what is your suggestion for young coaches? What is the best way uh, to, be, uh, to become a, go a very good coach? Uh, maybe it's a bad thing, but now coach Tubakovic lost. So he is not the big name at this moment because we are sad for defeat. But I learned also from coach Tubakovic Lubisha because we were in China together. I was in basketball club and he was in football club champion of China. And at that time, uh, his friend was the, uh, the greatest uh, chief commander of the police units in 90s. Uh, he was a judo uh, champion, uh, Radovan Sturgic match. And he was a big fan of partisan. He was always telling to Tumba, if you want to become a good coach, you have to go from the D1 level to D2 level. Coach who didn't have defeat and didn't feel defeat, he is not going to be a good coach. And if you want to learn to stand up first, you have to fail down. Really, you know, that guy is not alive anymore. Many controversies are about him. But you know what uh, uh, What that general said to Ljubiša Tubaković were words which I would always remember. Coaches have to fear purgatory in order to become the best. So young coaches should not be copy-paste, but they should try everything they think is beneficial and useful. And of course, whoever starts to work just because of money, he is in the wrong business. You have to have many, many, many absences in your pocket in your wallet that one day you gain something. Also with the players, you, as Bozja Bakovic says, love your players. If you don't love them, substitute them. You don't need them. Players who you love, they have to play for you. Players who you don't stand, don't waste your time with them. So this is a little bit what I could share with you if I could help anyhow. Yes. I'm excited. Yes, I am very happy for this conversation. Thank you, Vladimir, your time. And I wish you great success and best results with the Rwanda national team. And I hope that we will continue our conversation next time. Next time. See you again. Bye-bye. See you again. Bye-bye for everybody. Bye-bye.